There we go. If you participated in the 2023 Women in Publishing Summit, you may recognize Louise. She came in and did a really fun um, uh an interesting uh, <laughs> seminar, Do Dead Bodies Stand Up? Talking about, we're taking a real big shift here. So <laughs> talking about those who are writing about grief, uh, not grief, those who are writing about death, maybe crime books, maybe a death scene or whatever would have the tools to write about it appropriately. And, and in a way that people are like, that would never happen. Today, she's back to tell us about writing authentically when you're writing stories, novels, books that incorporate grieving into your, into your book, writing about those things in a very authentic way. So I am going to say thank you, Louise, for being here. I'm going to turn off my camera and mute myself and go into the background and you should be able to share your screen and do all the things that you need to do okay i think that's up now you guys can all see that it is but we see the small version we see your slide okay. so uh welcome to good grief writing an authentic grief experience in your novel and if you were here for the previous panel you learned some things about uh, how to take care of yourself while you're writing about traumatic things but this is how to make those traumatic things work in your book. Louise, yes. are you able to, um, uh, is this through Canva, are you able to put it on the full screen? Right now we're seeing mostly the um, presenter slides and your slides are small. Okay, it um, did not share the, um, I have two monitors here, so it was sharing a different screen. So let me, oh, I need to turn off screen sharing, I think. Um, Give me one second. Oh my gosh, this happened to me in our in, in a thing we were doing last week. I just kept sharing the wrong thing. <laughs> I was like, you right. think I did this for a profession or something? Okay. Oh, there's the thing. I moved my um, my task bar and uh, because it was blocking something else that I was using the other day and then I lost it. So I will start my screen presentation thing. And... My and then my Zoom window disappears. Of course, <laughs> of course, technology. Okay, so maximize this. Where did it go? <laughs> Anyways, I was listening to the previous uh, webinar, and I heard the the tail end of it was about like how do you um, support somebody who is grieving, and um, people that are offering to help they they don't know what to do and right. just say oh call me if you need anything that right. totally doesn't work no it doesn't <laughs> so i want people to know that offering concrete um uh, things like bring over a, a stack of paper plates and paper towels and um toilet paper kleenex where is this thing there it is um those are the things that people are going to go through um, in abundance when they have all these strangers coming over to their house. So just having those supplies on hand takes one little burden off of them or offering to um, run errands for them. Just say, hey, do you need me to pick up some dry cleaning? Um, yeah. Do you need me to take something over to the funeral home? That is is tremendously helpful. We are all squared away. Thank okay. you. Um, in it, yeah, putting that out there like yeah, just call me if you need anything. That is too much for somebody to um, to deal with. Okay, I finally got my other screen up. I found it. Um, dual monitors are a whole mess. So, like I said, this is Good Grief, writing an authentic grief experience in your novel. And a little bit about me real quick. If you don't know who I am, I am a funeral director and embalmer by trade, and I semi-retired to raise my kids. And I've been, in the meantime, writing and teaching other people about funerals and dead bodies. I've turned to educating writers. That's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I have a specialty in trauma reconstruction. So if you need that for your book, you can um, write me in and ask. And I do other weird things, like I'm a welder, and I do demolition derbies. And I live in Los Angeles with my family, um, a bunch of cats and dogs and a giant dinosaur. Okay, this is what we're going to cover today. <clears throat> There's no need to copy all of this down. I would rather that you either take a photo of the screen or watch the replay. Uh, 
I'm going to be moving pretty quickly. So you're, you're going to want to watch it again if you really need this information for your work. Otherwise, just let this spark inspiration. Try to connect with your own feelings and experiences and pluck out the things relevant to your characters. Some of these concepts that I'm going to cover might trigger you as I speak about them or later on as you're writing about them. So if you need to step out, you can catch the replay. Just make sure that when you do get to writing these later, that you have the proper support and um, you have a plan before you start writing in case you trigger yourself then. That's kind of what they were talking about in the, the previous session. Take care of yourself while you're writing these things. Okay, but why does this matter? Why do we need to write grief into our books? Um, first of all, it's annoying and disingenuous when characters experience a major loss and then are seemingly unaffected by the next chapter. Grief lingers. It alters your views. It should probably skew the characters for the rest of the whole book. So don't allow them to just get over it and move on. That's not how it works. We know about kill your darlings, but don't forget about breaking your survivors. The death in the book does not even need to be the rock bottom event. It can be that the death causes your character to spiral even further. So apply internal pressures until those pressures become external like the grief causes overwhelm and withdrawal, possibly leading to relationship trouble, maybe losing their job, financial insecurity. Then have them try to fix their problems badly. You know, have them screw it up. Try and put a quick fix Band-Aid instead of addressing their issue and then let, let it blow up in their face. Um, authenticity will resonate. And those sound like buzzwords, but it's really true. If you can tap into your reader's emotional experiences, they'll connect with your book. Bonus points if you can make them cry, because it actually is helpful for them. Did you know that grief tears are chemically different than tears from happiness or just eye lubricating tears? Um, they flush out the stress hormones in your body, and they trigger a release of feel-good chemicals like endorphins and oxytocin, which is why you feel better after a good cry. So make your readers cry. It's good. And then lastly, an accurate portrayal of grief helps normalize and validate people's lived experiences. It gives your readers permission to explore their grief when perhaps they've been discouraged from it by reasons that I'll get into in a bit. Your book could have a profound effect on someone else's grief journey. And if they haven't experienced a significant loss yet, it can prepare them for what they might encounter. So let's start at the beginning with something we're probably all familiar with. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Stages of Grief. This model is really widespread, really well known, and it's an easy way to check our progress, right? No, unfortunately it's not. Throw this out the window right now. This study was done back in the 60s, and it was done on people with terminal illness and how they processed their diagnosis. It should have been called the five stages of receiving catastrophic news. It was not meant for their loved ones grieving their death but it's been sort of extrapolated into that since then. And now we're just stuck to it like glue. It was also a very flawed study. The subject pool was really small. It wasn't diverse. It wasn't even a valid research experiment. It was just a collection of case study interviews. So this is not science that we need to be relying on. But it's human nature to wanna to make order out of chaos. We want a prescribed roadmap. The problem is with this, it's too rigid, it's too linear, it makes people feel like they're doing grief wrong. Judging ourselves against something like this can make us feel isolated or that we failed at grief. Again, throw this model out the window and do not use it in your books. Let's take a look at what grief really looks like. So this is more like it. Note that there's a beginning, but there's no end. There's no timeline, there's no order, it's a hot mess. It's unpredictable. There's so many ups and downs. It's like the world's saddest roller coaster. It's possible to take one step forward and then two steps back. Also, this is a big thing that people don't realize. You are allowed to feel multiple conflicting emotions at the same time, like happy and sad at the same time. You can be happy that someone is gone and then sad about the loss of a future reconciliation with that person. You can feel relief that your caretaking burden is gone, and then you can feel guilt over feeling relief about that. So it's important to recognize that there's a lot of different ingredients. It's not just that prescribed order of stages to go through. It's just all of these all at once back and forth. We have some different uh, types of loss. 
<clears throat> death is the biggest category of loss, but within that there's nuances. We treat loss and grief a little bit differently depending on how we can rationalize it. An expected death, while still hard, is much easier than a sudden death. It's easier to accept the death of an elderly person than a young person. Miscarriage is sometimes an unseen loss, or it can be viewed as lesser, and I want to make sure everyone knows it is not. Pet loss seems like it shouldn't be as significant as a human loss, yet many people feel a bigger impact by the loss of their pet than someone in their family. A traumatic death can be physical, like injuries from an accident, or emotional trauma for those that witnessed it. And suicide is a stigmatized loss, which creates difficulty in grief that I'll discuss in a bit. We also have non-death losses, which are still powerful, especially when they happen kind of all at once. They just pile up on you. Um, a loss of independence, that can mean somebody who's incarcerated, or it can mean you're getting older and you have to finally admit that you're unable to drive your car or care for yourself without asking for help. Um, you can grieve divorce, splitting with a partner or even a best friend or a social group. Infertility, that's kind of like the loss of the future. Loss of a job can impact both your self-esteem and your financial stability. Loss of a home, that's loss of security, memories. Uh, loss of identity can follow any of these types of loss, death or otherwise, and throw you into an existential crisis. We have to grieve all of these types of losses. Sometimes it's normal, sometimes it's straightforward, and other times it's a little bit more complex. So it might fall into one of these categories here. Now, there is a bunch of categories. I'm going to run briefly through these, but this slide will be up for a while in case you're taking notes or want to get a screenshot. Also, these words and definitions are listed in my free glossary, which I'll tell you about how to get that at the end in case you want that. <clears throat> First of all, abbreviated grief. This is a genuine kind of grief that passes quickly, and that could be due to a distant relationship, a long illness preceding the death, or finding something else to fill the void. It doesn't mean that you weren't grieving properly. It just, you, you moved up the timeline a little bit. Absent grief. This is where you have little to no symptoms of normal grief, could be due to disbelief, denial, shock, avoidance, or pressure to stay strong for the children or others. Anticipatory grief, this is mourning an impending loss. This is like someone who's been diagnosed with cancer and knows that they've got less than six months. So you're gonna be grieving all through that six months, even though the person's still alive. This can be experienced by the family members and also the person that is dying. Collective grief, this is experienced by a group or a community united by a shared loss. This could be the death of a leader, a celebrity, a widespread loss from war, natural disaster, pandemic, or another tragedy like a car full of local high school graduates drifting off the road. The community needs to come together to grieve together on that. Complicated grief, it's also known as exag exaggerated grief, persistent complex bereavement disorder, or prolonged grief disorder, which is finally now recognized in the, the DSM-5, the Big Book of Mental Disorders. This one involves intense, persistent, and debilitating grief lasting longer than 12 months with no improvement. That time frame isn't absolute because grief varies so much, but it's similar to clinical depression and can even happen at the same time as it. But there are enough differences that it needs to be identified and treated accordingly with therapy, medication, or other support. It's kind of like grief on steroids. Compounded or cumulative loss, that's when you mourn several losses close together. It can be losses from death, it could be non-bereavement losses, and it makes each loss more difficult to process. Think of it like getting a concussion, then getting multiple other concussions. It'll make your reco recovery exponentially harder, even if each bonk on the head wasn't that severe, it just all adds up. Delayed grief is experienced months or years after the loss. That's perhaps due to keeping busy, Alexa, suppressing grief for the sake of handling responsibilities, pressure to stay strong for others, or an inability to process at the time of death. <clears throat> Disenfranchised grief. This is a big one with great potential for conflict in your book. This is when you mourn a loss that's deemed by society as illegitimate or less important. This could be the death of someone distant, a coworker, a former spouse. It could be a pregnancy loss, a pet, a non-bereavement loss. It also applies to stigmatized deaths like suicide, drug addiction, 
HIV, AIDS, or execution. These mourners find it difficult to grieve and do not receive adequate support. They suffer in private and may wrestle with the idea that they're even allowed to grieve for these losses. Distorted grief is a form of complicated grief that manifests with extreme behavioral changes like rage, hostility, guilt, and self-destructive actions. It's associated with sudden traumatic deaths, the death of a child, or perceived blame at whatever caused the death. Inhibited grief is a type of grief that has been restrained or suppressed and often ends up manifesting into physical symptoms like sleep issues, stomach problems, aches, pains, headaches, and other health issues. This can be due to a reluctance to show emotion or a conflict about grieving a loss perceived to be shameful, like an overdose or suicide. Masked grief is a type of suppressed grief where the bereaved doesn't associate their new behaviors and symptoms with loss, and they seek to conceal them behind normal behavior. This can be seen in men who have been taught not to cry or after secretive, shameful type losses. It often manifests into physical symptoms like sleep issues, stomach problems, aches and pains, or sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. Um, yeah, you can, you can feel all those with that too. Um, Non-bereavement grief, we've touched on this before, but for the record, it's a type of grief that doesn't involve death, but can have similar emotional and physical impacts like divorce, infertility, estrangement, loss of friendship, loss of a career, loss of financial security, loss of a home, loss of independence, physical well-being. Regrief, this can mean two things. First, it can be when adults are triggered into unexpected bursts of grief later in their grief journey. Just out of nowhere, you just hit with something and you blow up for seemingly nothing. It can also refer to an evolving form of grief as children grow. And I'll go into that in a few more slides. Lastly, traumatic grief. This is pretty self-evident. This is the grief that arises from a sudden unexpected death, often triggering extreme stress reactions or post-traumatic survival mechanisms. So I know that was kind of a lot all at once, but again, this is all available in my free glossary. It's on my website. Okay, manifestations. You might have a clue about what grief looks and feels like, but let's go over some details. These are clues that someone is grieving and can be expressed in dialogue, body language, and thoughts. Bear in mind how your character would express their grief, though. Do they hide it, or do they wear their emotions on their sleeve? It's not just their personality, but their upbringing and their cultural background. I'll give you clues on that later. Grief can be physical. It's actually possible to die of a broken heart, by the way. Uh, there's a condition called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which is a temporary ballooning of the left ventricle. It's triggered by extreme emotions and stressful situations affecting more women than men. And it has heart attack-like symptoms that are usually treatable, but they can be fatal. <clears throat> Crying. This is an obvious manifestation and it comes in many forms. You can range from a reserved quick dab at the eyes with a sniffle to sobs that physically rack the body so hard that you collapse. There's a special type of scream that's unique to mothers upon being told that her child has died. And also when she sees their body for the first time, it's absolutely chilling and makes your hair stand on end. I've heard this many times working in a mortuary. Um, some cultures wouldn't dream of screaming or wailing, but others are near, nearly performative in their extremes. Grief often causes the people to neglect themselves. Uh, they either forget or don't care enough to take care of themselves. They're not driven to eat, to sleep, to bathe like they normally would. Uh, their voice can be weak and cracking, either from crying or an Ill inability to speak without crying. <clears throat> um, grief causes physical pain, headaches, stomach aches, a tight chest, difficulty breathing. The nonstop crying leads to dry, red, swollen eyes and congestion. Someone's posture and bearing can change entirely as if they're being crushed under a weight. Uh, sometimes people resort to medication and alcohol to avoid the pain. So figure out if they need to appear sedated or drunk. They might also show a, a loss or a gain in weight. We've touched on some of the mental uh, manifestations or emotions that people experience. The highlights here are numbness, which is one of the most common occurrences among people I've worked with. People also feel anger, both at the deceased, maybe they took unnecessary risks, or they did something that actively led to their own death. Um, you can feel anger towards the living, 
because they move on too quickly and they wonder why you're grieving so much they can't understand. There's also anger toward those who are culpable for the death. Um, if justice wasn't served, then that just adds even more anger. Displaced anger is taken out on innocent bystanders. Um, for example, funeral directors making arrangements with a person who is mad at the whole world. Fear is another big one. The fear of losing someone else, the fear of a future without their person, the fear of forgetting them, either forgetting how, what their voice sounds like, what they smelled like, um, forgetting just any of those little details that are so precious. Uh, the last one on here is total exhaustion. The mental manifestations can be so demanding on the body physically. It's important to recognize that. If you want more information about the manifestations, the physical and emotional signs, I highly recommend these resource books, The Emotion Thesaurus and The Emotional Wound Thesaurus by Angela Ackerman and Becca Puglisi. They're amazing. And there's um, every emotion that you would want to look up in there uh, and get all the ins and outs of those. Next thing is kids and grief. <clears throat> Anyone old enough to love is old enough to grieve. So don't overlook them in your book. I have an extensive uh, blog post on my website that goes uh, a lot deeper into the stages and the level of understanding the kids have. So I'll make sure you have that link at the end. Um, but first of all, most important thing to notice is kids are literal. Avoid euphemisms unless you're trying to sow confusion in your book. So if you tell a kid that you put their dog to sleep, they'll tell you to wake it up. If you tell them that someone died because they were old, then they will panic because technically everybody they know is old compared to them. And they think that everybody is now at risk of dying suddenly. If you say a relative passed, left, or went to be in a better place, they, they won't understand that. They will think that it's absolutely literal. Don't get me started on things like kick the bucket. Don't lie to kids or they'll find out and use it against you, okay? Um, if you tell a child that their person died in a car crash and they actually died by suicide or overdose, they will absolutely find that out. That secret will never stay buried. Um, that's a way that you can add some tension and conflict even, into even the most loving relationships in your books. Um, lying to a child like this damages their trust, even though it's well-intentioned. Age and maturity has a huge effect on how kids perceive grief. Uh, they tend to be egocentric, like how does this affect me? Um, they go through rough stages uh, where they have different concerns, like from zero to two, they wanna know when their person is coming back. They don't understand permanence. Um, they might have regressions or milestone delays. They might have changes in eating and sleeping habits, increased crying and distress. Uh, then from ages two to four, they still don't fully grasp permanence, but they also start, start to wonder if maybe this could happen to somebody else. They can experience brief yet intense reactions, regressions, anxiety, repetitive questions, tantrums, magical thinking. That's like their thoughts and words have power. And they have concern about the safety, their own safety, and who will take care of them. Kids from five to eight have more concrete thoughts, but with a tendency towards those magical and fantastical thoughts. They might see death as reversible still, or they might think that they caused the death by wishing it. They can display short periods of strong reactions and then act like nothing happened. They can have behavioral changes and regressions, plus lots and lots of repetitive questions, because every kid that age has a million questions, but they'll ask you the same things over and over and over as they process the death and, and hear the same information over and over. From nine to 12, they start understanding that death is final. They might display curiosity about the physical aspects of death. They're a little bit more self-conscious about displaying, displaying their own emotions and might have disruptive behavior at school, withdrawal from friends, changes in eating and sleeping. Then from ages 12 to 20, those kids are capable of abstract thoughts about death. Um, they can think about the afterlife. They might search for meaning. <clears throat> Earlier, I said I talked about regrief. Um, this is when kids grow and their brains evolve, and then they reprocess their loss through a more mature lens. They begin to understand their loss in new ways and feel different impacts. Think about the way that the, the toddler would miss their parent versus how a teenager suddenly realizes their parent won't be present for their wedding. They'll never meet their grandchildren.
They have to grieve their loss again and again in different ways as they grow up. <clears throat> Cultural differences. This is an important thing to think about, especially if you're writing outside of your own demographic. Even a character that is mixed with a culture different than yours, it merits careful consideration. Even though death is inevitable and universal for every human being on earth, we do not all experience grief the same way. We view loss and grief through our lens of our own culture, our religion, our upbringing. So don't apply your experience to those of other backgrounds. Let me give you some quick examples of variations in how we process grief. Use these to open your eyes about how your character's backgrounds influence their reactions. So in Northeastern Brazil, the mothers in this impoverished area only mourn their infants or children for a few days, and then they're calm and cheerful. Contrast that with uh, experiencing a major loss in the slums of Cairo. There, you're expected to grieve hard for years and years. You have to remain in muted depression and constant suffering, but it's culturally normal and supported. So those are two entirely different viewpoints in, in different backgrounds. In Bali, people treat death lightly. They joke, they tease, they remain calm, they maintain emotional control. The reason is because in their culture, emotional agitation makes them more vulnerable to the sorcery of malevolent people. There is a practice in Papua New Guinea where it's completely permissible to beat up a friend who reminds you of a loss. And then the victim actually pays compensation to the aggressor. For them, it's totally fine to express anger and aggression. This kind of beating does not represent wrongs redressed, but rather a pattern of reciprocity and legitimizing another's feelings. But like, think about how that would go over in the United States. That's totally different. Cultures around the world have what we would consider superstitions, but these are just normal parts of their upbringing, their culture. Um, things like fearing the wind because it brings dangerous spirits, fearing the act of naming the deceased and calling up a dangerous ghost, fearing being haunted after an inability to perform the adequate death rites. Maybe you're in a country where they don't facilitate what you need for the proper disposal of that body. Um, witchcraft as a cause of death is totally normal in some places. Dealing with a deceased as a god, expecting the next baby to be born as a, a reincarnation of that person. Self-mutilation is normal in some places. Death is, it's a common experience uh, in some underprivileged communities, but remember that that constant presence of death doesn't mean people aren't sad. It, do, it does make them more familiar though. Familiarity makes it easier to accept. So contrast that with a first world country in which a person sometimes isn't exposed to uh, death until they're an adult. You know, what do they think when a death happens? They're not used to it. They've never seen it before. It's not normal and common. Uh, lastly on here, think about the different triggers for other cultures. Um, for example, a garden full of marigold flowers in front of a hospital. You might think that that's, that's beautiful, it's lovely, but it would have a very different impact on a Mexican family. Uh, for them, marigolds are associated with death and uh, Dia de los Muertos. So if you write something like that, like giving a Mexican family marigolds as a, a get well bouquet, that's going to make people cringe. So these are things to be conscious of when you're writing about cultures that are outside of your own. Okay, pressures. We're going to get back to being a little bit ethnocentric. Um, in the United States, we unfortunately have an unreasonable societal expectation around grief. We want people to get back to normal. We give them a week, a month following a death, and then we start thinking, okay, it's time to move on. Let's get back to things. And that that's not realistic at all. We want them to put their grief on a shelf and just return to the way that they were. We want them to rejoin society, perform well at their job, pick up where they left off with their friends and their lovers, and just pretend they're fine. It's ridiculous. But you can use this sort of pressure to apply it to your character. Make them rage and despair against the unfairness of the, that standard. Contrast how other characters get back to their lives full of fun and color and getting together with families while your other character sits alone and it's just a gray limbo that they're stuck in. They're probably going to be resentful of the others for leaving them behind. Have your other characters display impatience and frustration with the grieving character. 
um, they they don't want to wait for this person to fully process their grief. They they just want them to be happy again. And it's a little bit selfish, but that's the way that the that people treat grieving people. Force your character to stay strong for the sake of others and then have them suffer in silence until they self-destruct. Make multiple characters grieve in different and conflicting ways, like have one partner turns outward and the other partner turns inward. Use that to drive a wedge in between them. <clears throat> have them turn it into the grief Olympics, which this is where everyone tries to outdo each other with who has it worse or, or who's suffering the most. Consider adding a little generational trauma and family members with unresolved grief. Then throw in some guilt and shame, whether that's um, merited or unfounded. Sometimes people perceive guilt where there is none. Add some doubt. Have your character question their religion or beliefs. Is there going to be an afterlife? Will we be, um, will we have a reunion with our loved ones or is that the end? Um, let's see. Different cultures have different traditions and expectations from the time period that you're supposed to be actively grieving to the clothing that you're supposed to wear to the things you're prohibited from doing. But what about a character who's at odds with their cultural expectations and the hardship that it would create within their family, um, whether they want to grieve slower or faster than what's prescribed, um, or if they come from a mixed background, they might have conflicting paths to choose from. They might alienate one side of the family. Um, an example here, Jewish families sit Shiva, they gather together for seven days, and there's a lot of specific rules to abide by, but secularization and busy lives had loved, have led newer generations to observe fewer days and fewer customs. So how does that affect the family dynamics? Okay, the long-term effects of grief. <clears throat> grief doesn't go away after a certain time period. You might think that it's pretty much behind you, and then all of a sudden, it pops up again out of nowhere. Think about the things that might trigger your characters and plunge them back into a highly emotional state. It could be hearing a certain song, catching a whiff of a particular smell, or being in a certain place. Holidays are a big trigger. Maybe it's the, the taste of that meal that you only have once a year, and it's the first time that you've experienced this holiday without your person. Your character might think that they're okay and then unexpectedly fall apart. Other circumstances that can drag out the normal grief experience and border on unhealthy territory um, consider the open-ended grief of a family whose loved one's body was never found, or one who died at the hands of another and justice was not served. They're missing a sense of closure. Uh, there's no order restored to their universe. PTSD, of course, death or other losses can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, these people can suffer a range of symptoms like emotional volatility, a constant state of hypervigilance, nightmares, disturbing thoughts, and other depression-like symptoms as they repeatedly relive that trauma. Um, they need treatment. Their condition can absolutely be debilitating and impair their ability to, to function in daily life. So uh, another disorder that goes kind of hand in hand with that is prolonged grief disorder. We talked about this earlier, but again, this is basically when the intensity of a loss doesn't diminish over time. Instead, this person suffers intense emotional pain, numbness, loneliness, disbelief, avoidance, identity disruption, difficulty reintegrating, and a feeling that life is meaningless. Note that a lot of these are just normal grief symptoms, but the difference here is that these ones are extreme in intensity and duration, and therapy and support groups can help. So on to coping and healing. <clears throat> Some unhealthy coping mechanisms you can give, give to your characters, things like substance abuse, under overeating, taking risks, denial or avoidance, obsessing, controlling, isolating themselves, overworking, seeking constant distractions, self-harm, aggression. These things all provide short-term relief, but they're simply a temporary fix that delays the grief process and can end up harming the person. Healthy coping mechanisms. Things like talking, journaling, writing, exercising, even if that's yoga, allowing time to express and process emotions, joining support groups, therapy, activism, socializing, memorializing. These are all positive things that help your character sort of re, you know, find their place back where they used to be. When your character finally learns that it's okay to let go of what's holding them back, you don't have to get rid of their pain. Allow them to live beside it, 
but with a newfound strength and tolerance. They don't need to get over this loss. They can hold space for their lost, lost loved one while learning to live again. They might start a new relationship, but it doesn't need to be a replacement. I want to share a concept real quick that illustrates this. It's called kintsugi. It's when broken Japanese pottery is repaired, but instead of um, hiding the cracks, they, they insert gold into the cracks. The cracks remain visible and become part of the beauty and the character of the piece. The philosophy with that is to embrace the flaws, allowing them to be part of the piece's history instead of disguising it or pretending it never broke. And I think that's just a beautiful concept to apply to broken people that when they're repaired, there's still evidence of that trauma. There's a story there. Um, it's not erased. It's not invisible. It's still a part of them. This transformation and growth is usually essential to character arcs. So think about how this grief process eventually allows your character to hope again, to see color again, to live again. Think about how they can use this opportunity to reinvent themselves and then give the reader a satisfying conclusion to their tale. Here's a quick list of some of the, the books that I've seen lately that have included loss or grief uh, in really powerful ways. You probably recognize some of these. <clears throat> loss can be included in any genre. It just depends on how you use it. A loss is something that drives characters to take action, to change. Uh, the type of loss needs to be appropriate for the genre, like probably don't include a traumatic and gory murder in a romance book. But instead, decide whether grief comes from outside of a relationship, like an elderly family member dies, or within the relationship, maybe one of the partners loses their job, or is the loss the relationship itself? So not gory, still a loss. Many genres uh, lend themselves to a loss prompting a desire for revenge. So uh, thrillers and horror books, I mean, that's, that's powerful right there. Uh, memoirs. This allows you to explore and process your own grief, tap into your lived emotions to connect with readers and stir up those feelings in them. Uh, again, this is something you wanna be careful with when you're writing about your own grief because that might bring up some trauma. So you need to have that plan in place. And that is the end of this presentation. Um, like I said, you can find some information on my website about how to download that free glossary with all those terms. Um, you can find that blog post about how to support kids in grief and how they um, approach it from different ages. That's really valuable for both writing and for personal use. So if you've ever got somebody saying, um, help, how do I tell somebody, or how do I tell a child that somebody has died? It's a super valuable resource for that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. If, um, if you wanna contact me after, if it's private, you can find my email address here. Uh, I'm also on most social media platforms, but especially on threads. That's my, my most recent hangout. So with that, I'll leave the slide up for a minute. And Alexa, if you want to see if there's any questions or anything yeah. you want to ask me. There are a few. This was so good, Louise. And I can tell you as somebody who has been, I've probably done every, I checked off every item on all this coping skills, good and bad. And it's so true that that, that you um, really, really wrapped this up nicely. Um, also want to say I completely, completely what you're saying about the children and grief is so true. I mean, we saw this a lot, especially when um, we in the infant loss community talk about babies born sleeping. And that's so confusing. So many times people saying, well, if they're sleeping, why can't, you know, my, my kids asked me so many questions and um, I just finally was very, very frank with them. And you know what? They could handle it. They would, we, I think a lot of people are so scared of talking about grief with their children and traumatizing them in another way, but they, they're just, like you said, they're so literal and they just, they need answers that don't scare them. Um, but, oh my gosh, this was so good. Okay. I see one question in the question box and that is and then I know if if y'all had questions I saw several of them get dropped in the um, chat if you could put them in the Q&A box so that we don't miss them and make sure that we can answer but Christy says wondering if an elementary age kid could try to keep a friend who's died alive by keeping them as an imaginary friend or or taking aspects of what they love most about them into their own personality I don't see why not I mean, um, I'm not sure what the the parameters are for 
the ages of kids and imaginary friends. But um, kids are, like I said, they're prone to that magical thinking. So why not? Uh, and, and they just, they're going to process it in, in whatever way makes sense to themselves. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to make sense to us. Right. Uh, the, this is an interesting thing is that kids process grief sometimes by uh, reenacting things that you'd think, oh my God, that's horrific. Um, there was, I think the Oklahoma city bombing, they had kids in neighborhood schools that were reenacting, like they had built block towers and they would knock them down. Like, oh, that's the building. Mm -hmm. And their caretakers were like, oh my God, this is horrific. But they were able to reframe that into a healthy way by saying, okay, well, why don't you build a little hospital next to the tower and take care of people, you know, survivors. And, um, it helped them to sort of reenact this this trauma over and over to understand it, but then reframe it in a positive and healthy way. I love that so much. Um, when my daughter was really young, she would, she would play with Catherine, Catherine, her twin sister would come and visit her. And then she would come into the house and tell me that she'd just been outside playing with her twin who might've tell her that she wasn't, I don't know what happened, but they, um, to that point, I think a lot of kids naturally just do that. They still keep them with them in their imagination. Or maybe not in their imagination. Who knows, you know? Um, Okay, the Japanese proverb. It's a Japanese practice, not a proverb, right? Can you repeat that one again? Kintsugi. Um, If you look it up, it's K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I. And it's like a broken piece of pottery, like a teapot. And when they glue it back together, uh, the cracks are filled with gold. And it's just beautiful because it it showcases that flaw and it becomes part of the item's story. And it's the same, you know, for people that have loss. It's like, this happened. It didn't get better and is invisible now. It's a part of that person. It affected them. Um, but it doesn't have to be damaging anymore. Oh, I love that. That is so beautiful. You know, I think Americans might be some of the worst at handling grief. There are so many beautiful practices and others, even within our own community, uh, the Jewish community has an absolutely beautiful practice around, around grief and having, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I would also say just to add to, and you may, I had stepped out for a second. So if you covered this, I'm really sorry. I, I the punching people out, I thought was hilarious. There were, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but there were definitely some people that I wish I could have hit. <laughs> <laughs> if I was that kind of person in the, you know, mm-hmm. the ones who said you can get a dog. Uh, um, but uh, we, I had a friend whose husband passed away and she's Jewish and their celebration lasts a year, our celebration, memorialization, the grief process. And at the end, we came back to the gravesite and we all placed rocks on his grave and there was another ceremony. I mean, there's some beautiful, beautiful things you can incorporate into the grief process as well, just by looking at other cultures and other um, religious uh, ways around grief. But Okay, this is a great question from Shayla. What kind of people or characters are more susceptible to prolonged grief disorder? So anyone that's already got something going on, like depression and anxiety, um, many of us (laughs) um, have that going on. Uh, If you've got other complicating factors in your life, like those non-bereavement losses, all of those things pile up and just they could make a normal grief journey impossible because you've got too much to handle all at once. Uh, There is a percentage, I I forget the exact number, it's like, let's say 8% of people will be prone to prolonged grief disorder. Um, It's in the DSM, Shayla, I know you have one. So, um, but it's, it's a legit disorder now. And it's just one of those things, like what makes people prone to depression? You know, it's, it just, it is sometimes it's your background, it's your living situation, it's your stability and security, but it's also just one of those things. So it, it's good to be aware that it exists. So that way you can be conscious of, okay, I, I've been grieving. It's been over a year. I am not in the least bit better. Uh, not that you get better, but you're able to function and prolonged grief disorder is where you just, you cannot function. It's like day one. 
Yeah. I know one of the surprising things that I learned when I was going through all of my healing, and then I, I was certified as a, as a grief um, recovery counselor. And I learned that it, it's, it, it's wild to me because I have a friend who just lost her infant about maybe five months ago. And she's got people in her community who are already like pushing her to be over it. I learned through the, the therapy and through the training that I went through that the average time for grieving a significant loss is 12 to 18 months, 12 to 18 months. And we're here like six weeks, three months, six months, trying to tell people they just need to move on with their lives. Well, note that it takes some time. So I would say prolonged grief then even starts, you know, after that, when you see somebody's yeah. five, six yeah. years out and still is, is struggling. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the comments. Uh, yeah. The, the Jewish customs, again, the cloth that they, they pin to their clothes, um, they they have like a rending of garments at mm -hmm. the funeral. And because that's not really practical for a lot of people, you don't just rip up your suits as you're at the funeral. They have a special ribbon that you pin. And depending on if it's your parent or your spouse, you pin it on a different side of your chest. And it's a little ribbon that you tear while you're saying a prayer. And then you wear that ribbon. You keep wearing it because then that shows other people, I am grieving. Mm -hmm. And I wish that we had something like that yeah. uh, so that you could have it on your chest to say, I am grieving, you know, cut me some slack yeah. and, and, you know, cause all that grief is so unseen. And that's part of why we are like, well, aren't you better? Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful tradition. Um, let's see one more, this one more question. This is a good one. Can you talk more about trauma associated grief, including loss of innocence, the ideal? Yeah. So trauma and grief, um, they, they go together. I mean, every kind of loss can be traumatic. And then some of them are really extra traumatic. Um, and, and a lot of it depends on your perspectives, your, again, your stability or, um, your culture, but if you see someone die or it's unexpected, it's accidental, it might be your fault. Um, then those are going to lead to a lot of bigger emotions that are outside the ones that people are typically going to experience. So um, the guilt, uh, the shame, um, and then fear, uh, fear of this happening again to someone else. Um, that's something that, you know, like, how do you reconcile that this traumatic death happened? It can happen again. Um, so it's important to seek help for those losses. Um, I don't know. There, there's a lot more in those, um, those books that I have behind me, the, like the emotional wound thesaurus. Um, these kind of go into some of those other um, ways that trauma can, exp um, can come out. Like, for example, there's um, sections in this book about crime and victimization type uh, trauma, disabilities and disfigurements, failures and mistakes, injustice and hardship, misplaced trust and betrayals, uh, specific childhood wounds, traumatic events. And each of these has a list under them, like a child dying on your watch, a house fire, a life-threatening accident, a loved one's suicide, miscarriage, natural or man-made disaster, parents' divorce, school shooting, terminal illness. I mean, books like this, that's where you're going to go for all of that, that deep trauma information. That's such a great resource. I didn't even know about that book, but I'm definitely adding that to my list to buy. Yeah. And it's a whole series. These are really great books. They're thick, nice, thick book here. Um, what are the other ones? I just, I want you guys to know all about this series because they're so fantastic. Um, what's in the other one? Bear with me. Okay. Where did they go? There was a whole list of these um, like rural and urban settings is, is one of their um, emotion amplifiers. Uh, did you uh, say it's called the, um, I didn't write it down, the emotion and trauma thesaurus. Okay. This one's the emotion thesaurus. The other one's the emotional wound thesaurus. And um yeah, they're, they have a whole series of these. There's like 
eight books or something. Um, highly recommended. That's great. <laughs> How have I acquired all this wisdom? <laughs> um, yeah, um, when I went to mortuary school, it was 20 years ago, uh, we took classes in thanatology, which is the study of death. Um, and we, we basically turn into grief counselors mixed with wedding planners as as a funeral director so trying to balance meeting with a family making funeral arrangements with all of the social and logistical things like a wedding but then navigating you know holding their hand as they're walking through this grief process uh, you have to learn a lot to um to work with people and to understand you know anger expressed is not at me it's at the world and i'm just in the way yeah. so I, I've seen all of this. I've talked to so many people and um, read tons of books. So it's just kind of a passion of mine. I want to do things like dispel that um, stages of grief. That is just the worst thing for grieving people to mm -hmm. give them that sense that they are failing at grief. They're doing it wrong. So if you have one takeaway from this, make that be it. This was such a powerful workshop. Thank you, Louise. This is just great information. And I think to, I think to the biggest, to the biggest point that you made that I just can't express enough is that if you've never experienced a loss, it's normal to write about loss and grief in your writing. I mean, everybody goes through these things. So, but to, to make sure that it's done in a way that people who have experienced massive grief aren't like, mm -hmm. okay, there is no way that a week later after this loss, that person's, you know, doing X, Y, or Z and really making sure that, that, why you said writing authentically about grief and people do weird things. I could tell you all kinds of stories of things that I have done in the last 12 years um, that a lot of people thought I was completely off my rocker. And it was because I was just trying to find myself again. Um, so, you know, people, be, yeah, this is so important as we're writing about this topic and as we're writing for others that we, that we know how to talk about it properly, that we know how to use the right terminology and that we, that we can incorporate these. So thank you so much for this. We got through all the questions. Does anybody have a last minute question that has, has popped up? And again, you can reach me on my website. Um, hisandhurstpress.com or louisepagella.com. Uh, you can email me there, find me on social media. I will answer questions as they come up for you because it's important to me to have these accurate portrayals, to normalize grief, to give readers permission to grieve, yeah. to show them that their grief is normal. It's They're not doing it wrong. Uh, yeah. These are so important to me. Yes, I love it. Well, thank you to our panelists that are still around from the first one. This was just, I think, a really, really impactful two hours. And um, I'm very grateful to all of you for participating. Thank you, Louise. And um, y'all know how to reach everybody. And we will have these replays hopefully loaded by um, tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to try to get them up tonight, but I am on my way out the door to a championship volleyball game for my daughter. So I can't promise that they will be up before tomorrow, but they will be up soon. If you desperately want to go back and watch the replay, we did broadcast these live stream them onto the Women in Publishing Summit Facebook page, not the group, the Facebook page. So you can go watch the videos immediately over on Facebook. All right, everyone, have a wonderful afternoon, and we will see you at our next event. Thanks again to my wonderful panelists and speaker, Louise. Bye. Bye.